uh, good day Saints, it's good to be back with you. Uh, been quiet for a little while, uh, we've been quite busy with other ministry obligations, but it's good to come to you and uh, today we're going to look at something very interesting. Uh, recently uh, in class, uh, as I was teaching, a student actually approached me and asked my opinion surrounding a very popular uh, theological trend or I should rather say perspective that is going and doing the rounds amongst um, very well-known televangelists and even theologians here in South Africa. Uh, he gave me a book of Dr. Theo Vomrons um, and in this book uh, we can, uh, I'm just going to read you some pages from this book uh, from chapter 7 uh, and in this book there's a sort of a descriptive uh, understanding given that God uh, in actual fact allowed for Jesus uh, to die on the cross, forsook him, um, and Jesus went from the cross right into the heart of the earth or to hell. God forsook him, uh, and basically Jesus became the first born again man in hell. Uh, I want us to look at this because uh, we see quite clearly that um, when we look at the biblical understanding of this passage of scripture, there are numerous interpretations of this text, uh, and we should be very upfront about it. But uh, when we look at this concept or understanding of what it means uh, with the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, we can see quite clearly that in the Apostles' Creed, uh, there's mention uh, of the fact that Jesus descended into Hades or hell. Uh, and let me just start off by saying immediately that we know it's not an authentic, uh, it's, uh, 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 it's actually not authentic when it comes to the, to the original understanding of the Apostles' Creed. Um, and we can see quite clearly that um, it was an addition, obviously an addition by the Roman Catholic Church in the 4th century um, to explain purgatory or that place of departed spirits uh, where entities went to, um, to atone for their own sins. So uh, when that addition comes into play, I think it's important for us to understand that we cannot deduce our theology from creeds or customs, even though it's a good indication as to what the church believe. Um, but ultimately we need to look at the scriptures uh, and the scriptures in itself. So let us start off and let me just read to you quickly what Dr. Theo Volmerans is in actual fact saying. Uh, again, a lot of the proponents that hold on to this uh, perspective, uh, it, you know, unfortunately we know that this um, was uh, not something new and this perspective is not something new. Uh, in fact, it, I, I think it was popularized um, by the notable Word of Faith um, scholar uh, E.W. Kennan in 1946. Uh, he published a book, What Happened from the Cross to the Throne. Um, and in this book, he describes the reality of what took place between the death of Jesus Christ on the cross when he breathed his last, right up to the dispensation when he went up to be with the Father in his resurrection in heaven. Uh, and this is nothing new. And in actual fact, when we look at what uh, Pastor Theo is uh, explicating, we can see quite clearly that it's deduced from them uh, and from this perspective. Other notable authors that are basically holding on to this perspective, Kenneth Copeland Ministries, if you look at their website, you can see quite clearly that they hold on to this perspective. Um, Kenneth E. Hagen, uh, Joyce Meyer, uh, also uh, Joel Osteen, um, all of these guys basically look at this and describe the reality of the cross and what happened between the cross and the throne through very much the same paradigm. Um, so I just want us to look at that today and ask the questions surrounding atonement because I think it's important for us um, to look at these things. So uh, let us start reading uh, in uh, chapter 7 of uh, Pastor or Dr. Theo von Rantz's book. Uh, he says at the bottom of the page, and again I've uploaded this to uh, Facebook, um, so you can read all the chapters as well. I actually took photos of the chapter, and uh, you're welcome to read with me, so you don't see if I take anything out of context. Um, at the bottom of page 109, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read through everything, but I'll just highlight in actual fact what uh, we can see in the book. It says the following, and he speaks from Colossians chapter 1 verse 18, um, where it speaks and it says that Christ was the firstborn from amongst the dead. Um, uh, the, he says the following, he says, uh, This cannot refer to his birth in the manger, uh, because he wasn't the first one to be born when he was born in the manger. It refers to being born back from the dead, or out of the dead, or back from among those who are in death. On the cross Jesus cried out, Father, Father, why have thou forsaken me? Uh, and let me just pause there. Um, we know, uh, for instance, that that was definitely um, the prayer of derelication. Uh, we see this quite clearly explicated in Mark chapter 15 verse 34. Um, also in Matthew chapter 27, uh, we can see quite clearly that uh, it is mentioned in verse 46 that Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, now, before we get on to the explanation for that uh, prayer or for what was said there, uh, let me just read uh, to you further what 
Dr. Theo says concerning this passage of scripture. He says, um, Jesus cried out, Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? It was at that moment that our Lord, that is Jesus Christ, slipped, our Lord Jesus slipped from life into death, uh, or you might say, was separated from God, the Father who is life. Now let me just pause there and say to you that this is problematic. Uh, and let me tell you why it is problematic. Well, first of all, when we read the scriptures in its full context, we can see, for instance, that Jesus speaks in John 5, 26. He says quite clearly that as the Father has life in himself, so the Son also has life in himself. Uh, in Acts chapter 3, verse 15, we can see at the, the uh, Paul, uh, Peter and John, uh, at the sermon that they preached, they make it absolutely emphatically clear that Jesus was the author of life. Uh, so what is the implication of someone like uh, Jesus being separated from God? Um, well, uh, the moment you assume that Jesus was separated from God ontologically, uh, what you do is just, or you create a separateness or a separate understanding of what God is in his ontology. So Jesus was maybe another God, uh, but he was not one with God uh, or the Father. And it is problematic for the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. It is also uh, very problematic for what actually happened with this perfect man, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Um, so when he speaks and he says that Jesus slipped from life into death, um, or we might say separated from God, the Father who is life. We know that Jesus was a perfect man. He was perfect God. We speak in theological terms of the hypostatic union. Jesus was a, uh, and I like what R.C. Sproul says here. R.C. Sproul, in actual fact, doesn't say Jesus was perfect God and perfect man. Um, he says Jesus was truly God and truly man, um, uh, which is just the reality that we need to contend with, which I think there's great wisdom in. So when we look at Jesus in his human suffering, he definitely experienced a torment on the cross for the sake of humanity because he felt the brunt of all sin. Uh, and that is very important to understand. And then uh, Dr. Theo says the following. He says, to be dead in our sins means to be separated from God who is life. Uh, and he gives two scriptures, James 1.15 in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. Uh, and yes, uh, when we, in actual fact, uh, when we are... We are born in sin. Uh, original sin is something that we should believe in, something we should hold on to. Man is not born without sin. David says quite clearly that man have been, I've been conceived in my mother's womb in sin. Um, no problem for the Christian there. Uh, and what Dr. Theo is doing here is in actual fact he is describing a reality where, where the spirit man of Christ in actual fact became sinful. Um, that the physical man of Christ was laid down in the tomb and the physical man was overwhelmed by sin uh, and death and unrighteousness uh, and overcome by the reality of sin uh, 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 for uh, uh, due to the original sin of Adam and Eve um, and he is therefore drawn into a place of hell uh, because he was made sinful and there in hell uh, in actual fact he suffered three days and three nights in the heart of the earth um, and let me just read it to you um, on the page of 110 uh, he says the following he says the Lord Jesus took us sin and the result of that sin is death he became the sum total of our sins, uh, and he didn't just take our sin. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he, God, made him Christ, who knew no sin, never sinned, to be sin for us. And Christ became the sum total of all sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. When Jesus was on the cross, he was the sum total of our sin at that moment. And God took out his wrath on him and punished him as though he had committed all that sin. And when he became sin, that sin brought death, and he was separated from God, who is life. And that was what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, the moment they ate the fruit. Um, again, <coughs> we can see quite clearly that there is an apprehension that sin ultimately separates man from God. Yes, it is true. Man is separated from God according to Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, in death, when they sin. Uh, but we understand that ultimately, if it was not for the act of God bringing rejuvenation and life, uh, man could not experience the full reality of life. Um, Dr. Theo then goes on uh, and he speaks and he says the following. Uh, he says that there is, um, and we will also look at that, the two theories on uh, the heart of the earth or uh, Hades or the place of departed spirits. Uh, he speaks in uh, about Acts chapter 2 verse 27 uh, about the full reality of Jesus being abandoned into Hades or in hell uh, and he also speaks and he says that Christ was left uh, in the grave uh, uh, ultimately. Uh, 
Uh, he also says the following, he says, once we were, and this is on the page of, uh, uh, bottom of page 113, um, he says the following, he says, once we were declared forgiven, the Holy Spirit entered into Christ while he was in the flames of hell, and this is when Christ entered back into the life of God, and this is when Christ was born from the dead, um, according to, uh, to Colossians 1.18. So what we see is, is that Christ, according to the explanation of Dr. Volmerans, in actual fact was declared forgiven in hell when he was tormented. After three days and three nights he was in the flames of hell. Uh, this is when God, and, and listen to this, when Christ entered back into life of God, uh, and this is when Christ was born from the dead, uh, according to Colossians chapter 1 verse, 30, uh, verse 18. Uh, well, Two problems with this perspective. First of all, uh, when we look at Christ being in hell, uh, there are numerous passages of scripture where Jesus declares quite clearly that he will not go to hell. He says to the thief on the cross, if it was Didymus, we don't know what his name was, but he says to the thief on the cross, today you shall be with me in paradise. Uh, Jesus makes it emphatically clear uh, that the sufficiency of the cross negated the reality uh, for the sinner to enter into the full spectrum of life and ultimately into the kingdom where Jesus would have gone um, as he describes his disciples in John chapter 14 verse 1. Uh, but he says the following and I want to read this to you as well. Um, Dr. Volmeron says the following at page 114 at the bottom of the page. He says this tells me and he quotes Romans chapter 8 verse 11 where he says that Christ, uh, you know, the scripture says that the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and just as he raised Christ from the dead uh, and then he says the following, he highlights that word dead, he bolds it. He says, this tells me that the very resurrection life of the Holy Spirit that entered back into Christ in the flames of hell, that raised him back into glory is in, uh, and that uh, reality is obviously in us. We have been raised to life from death in the same way. Whoa, that is just incredible. Uh, it assumes that uh, Jesus was totally forsaken on the cross. Um, there was a separation between the spirit man and the body, uh, which is which is actually so. His body was laid down in the flesh. His spirit man, uh, obviously, according to Dr. Volmerans, was tortured in hell, uh, was left in hell, and ultimately rejuvenated and rebirthed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, what is the implication of a doctrine like that? Well, first of all, uh, it's nothing different than purgatory that the Roman Catholics believe in, in that they say that man can atone for his own sins. Man, in actual fact, has a chance after death, which scripture just does not teach. Uh, in actual fact, scripture teaches us that there is life and then there's death, and after death immediately is the judgment. When we look at the reality of Christ, we can see quite clearly that Christ depicts a reality where he's not going to be in hell, uh, but in actual fact, he was uh, speaking to the thief on the cross and saying to him that today you will be with me in paradise. And when we look at the meaning of paradise, because a lot of people believe that there are two separate theories surrounding paradise, and we will look at that. But um, it says the following then on page 115, it says, When, that is Christ, uh, when he stood up for the glory of God at that moment in hell, being tormented by Satan and the demons, panic broke out, uh, and the Bible says he took the keys of hell and death from Satan and Jesus took back the authority of Satan that he stole from Adam and Jesus became the second or the last Adam. Uh, this is what Dr. Volmerans is saying. Uh, so uh, he conquered Satan uh, and ultimately took the keys uh, from the devil uh, and obviously this is brought into line with what we see quite clearly in uh, Revelations chapter 1 verse 8. Jesus speaks uh, to in the revelation of John. He says to John, uh, look uh, I've been dead, I've risen, I've taken the keys of death and life, I hold them. Um, and this is in actual fact uh, what people believe in. Uh, and uh, let me just start off quite clearly and let me uh, get into this. Uh, when we look at uh, Dr. Vomerantz's understanding of uh, the atonement and also when we look at his understanding of the substitution and imputation, um, it is important to, to note that in the Christian understanding of imputation, uh, Jesus in actual fact did not become sin. Um, and this belief that Jesus became sinful indicates a gross misunderstanding uh, of the Old Testament concept of substitution and even substitutionary sacrifice. Uh, the Levitical concept of, uh, you know, substitution, uh, which is basically the background that is used in explaining the life and death of Jesus upon the cross, uh, was definitely based on the understanding of the perfection uh, and the holiness of the sacrificial 
uh, lamb. Uh, and let me just give you a few scriptures. When we look at Leviticus chapter 4 verse 3, uh, when we look at Leviticus chapter 4 verse 3, and it's always good to have your Bible ready and to look at these things, it, it is important to note uh, that in Leviticus chapter 4 verse 3, uh, it, it is uh, important to note that uh, the uh, the author says the following, if the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt upon the people, he is to present the Lord uh, to the Lord uh, a young unblemished bull as a sin offering for the sin he has committed. Uh, again, the operative word is one that is unblemished. Also, what is important in verse 23, it says, or some, uh, if someone informs him about the sin he has committed, he has to bring an unblemished male goat, uh, in actual fact, uh, for his own sins. And in verse 32, you can actually have a look. It also speaks of that, of the reality of the fact that the animal uh, that was to be brought to sacrifice, uh, in actual fact, in this holy offering, uh, in actual fact, was supposed to be blemished. What then took place? Well, in chapter 4, verse 4, we can see that the priest extended his hand. Uh, he transferred uh, the, uh, the sin or the guilt of the sin onto the lamb. Uh, and, and we see this in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, and like I said, verse 24 and verse 33. Um, but it's important to note that the transfer, the transfer of sin uh, was a symbolic act. And it was not a physical act. Um, and this is something that should be noted. Um, these animals uh, 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 ultimately became sin through transference, not by nature. Uh, and just as the opposite was true, we can also see that at the moment trans of transference, uh, the offering in itself became holy unto the Lord. Um, and uh, it's interesting when you read a little bit further in Leviticus chapter 6, verse 25 to 27, to uh, you can also read verse uh, 29, uh, we can see that anyone who actually partook of the offering uh, or ate of it uh, or touched it uh, became uh, holy or, or, sacri uh, or absolutely separate, uh, uh, separated for the holiness of God. So the sacrificial animal, and this is very important, did not become sin, sin was symbolically imputed to the animal uh, and it was a substitute for sin. Um, and we can see quite clearly it was a substitute for sin. It was a holy uh, offering that atoned for sin by the virtue of its perfection uh, that was ultimately consecrated by God. So when Dr. Theo says that Jesus became sin, it actually violates the understanding of what it speaks of when we in fact speak of the perfect sacrifice that was given through Jesus Christ. Well, what about a, sin, uh, a scripture like 2 Corinthians 5.21 uh, that Dr. Volmerans is quoting, excuse me, <coughs> that Dr. Volmerans is quoting uh, where he says, but Jesus became sin. Um, well, uh, we can see quite clearly that sin was uh, symbolically imputed to Christ. Um, and we can see that it, it enabled Christ to become the perfect uh, substitution um, uh, and the one that was a sinless offering. Um, and this is what Peter draws upon. Uh, in actual fact, if you read 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, I'm going very quickly through this, so I do apologize. If you read 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 19, I just want to read this to you because this is what Peter draws from. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, we can see quite clearly Peter says the following. He says, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without defect or blemish. Uh, uh, well, he was destined before the foundation of the world. Uh, to be sacrificed, obviously, for us. Um, so the authors of the New Testament makes absolutely emphatic and uh, sure that this sacrifice was a perfect sacrifice in Jesus Christ. What about the author of Hebrews? Listen to what the author of Hebrews says, and I love the scripture. Hebrews is just such an incredible book. Hebrews chapter 9, <coughs> excuse me, in verse 14. How much more will the blood of the Messiah, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, uh, cleanse our consciousness from dead works to serve the living God. Well, Scripture makes it clear uh, again that he was without blemish. Uh, the Greek word for that is amomos, uh, which is a reference to the Levitical requirement uh, in actual fact 
uh, and the perfect sacrifice that was that was given in you can look at and you can see that in the Greek Septuagint um, in Exodus chapter 29 verse 1 um, so the writer of Hebrews even dictates and shows us quite clearly that uh, through the virtue of Christ's perfection there's in factual uh, in actual fact healing made for us so when someone like Dr. Theo Volmerans uh, speak about the doctrine of identification it in actual fact contradicts the fact of the scriptures when we look at some of the word of faith teachers we can see quite clearly um, that they explicate and say that Jesus became sin on the cross he was overcame by the devil and ultimately he was cast at the feet of the devil and left at the mercy of Satan himself um, some of these uh, teachers would even say that Christ in his very nature became satanic um, and he became evil or he absorbed sin in himself um, well, again, it is just absolutely, um, and I'm sorry to say this, but this is just overtly heretical, uh, and it's not supported in Scripture. Uh, and it's ultimately um, a, a denial of the sufficiency of the atonement and the death of Jesus Christ um, in his physical death. Um, so, when we look at some of these teachers, please note um, that some of them will say that the physical death of Jesus Christ cannot atone by itself. But scripture obviously reveals quite clearly um, and teaches the country. Um, Jesus uh, defeated death uh, and, and here's the thing. Jesus defeated Satan on the cross um, and not in hell through a spiritual death. Um, and we can see this quite clearly um, when it's made known uh, in the book of Colossians. So let me read this to you because this is important um, for us to understand. In Colossians chapter 2, uh, it says the following, Colossians chapter 2, uh, verse 13 and 15. Uh, and when you were dead in trespasses and uncircumcision of your heart, he made you alive with Christ and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to them and has taken it out of the, uh, uh, out of, it, uh, of the way by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers, now listen to this, and authorities and disgraced them publicly. And listen to this. He triumphed over them by him. Why? Uh, Jesus, in actual fact, triumphed by the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he overcame and made an open public display of anything and everything evil, and ultimately uh, uh, the devil was rendered powerless. And that's what Hebrews also says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Um, it says that through his death, by the act of dying on the cross, uh, he rendered powerless the one who had power over death, which was the devil. Um, so when we look at Jesus, when we get an understanding of Satan's defeat, uh, when we look at the way Jesus died on the cross, uh, we can affirm with Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. I know a lot of people use it for healing, uh, but it's actually a scripture on atonement. Uh, it says that uh, ultimately he bore our sins in his body on the cross. So there's a definite understanding that the death of Jesus on the cross was sufficient. Um, so uh, it is uh, very important for us to understand that all of these biblical authors assert that the physical Jesus, uh, physical death of Jesus in fact was that which atones uh, for our sin and redeems man ultimately from death. Um, and that is very important for us to understand. Um, so uh, let me just give you a few other scriptures uh, that will also just give you an indication of uh, that it was a uh, through the shedding of his blood that there was forgiveness uh, you can look at Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 uh, and I love this portion of scripture uh, because it's just absolutely great uh, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 he says the following it says according to law most everything is purified with the blood and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 19 we already looked at but listen to this in Acts chapter 20 verse 28 Acts chapter 20 verse 28 uh, listen to this it says the following it says be on your guard and for your flock among whom the Holy Spirit is appointed you as overseer to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his blood you see the sanctification that was established through the person of Jesus Christ was sufficient as a result of the person of Jesus Christ atoning for us on the cross uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 the atonement of Christ was an overtly physical act and that is something that we should look at and something that we should be honest about
So what do we do with a scripture like 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 19 uh, that says the following? And I want to read this to you. It says, in that state, what state? Well, he was made alive according to verse 18 in the spirit. So in the spiritual realm, uh, he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison. Verse 20 says, when the past were disobedient, when God patiently waited in the days of Noah, while an ark was being prepared uh, in it, a few, that is eight people who were saved through the water, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Uh, what, is, what, do we, what do we do with a scripture like that? It says that Jesus went uh, to the place of departed spirits or he descended uh, into the place where the spirits were in prison. Well, this is called the Hades view. And the Hades perspective uh, commonly uh, has the idea that uh, they are uh, basically uh, a great gulf between two separate places uh, before the coming of Christ. Uh, in Hades or Sheol, uh, one is the bosom of Abraham, where all the righteous individuals that were saved uh, by the grace and the covenant of Abraham were kept. Uh, and then the other place which all these individuals that were sinful uh, and not uh, in the covenant were kept. Uh, and they were basically in a separate compartment. And this great gulf separated both of these places. Uh, and again, no man could pass through both of these spheres. Uh, the section that held the saved individuals were called the bosom of Abraham, according to Luke chapter 16, 22. Uh, and then ultimately we can see that Christ was the first fruits from the dead uh, and ultimately ascended. Uh, and he led the Old Testament saints uh, into heaven for the first time with him uh, and obviously proclaimed um, the others lost and dead, according to 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20. Is there another perspective that we can look at? Yes, there is. Um, there's also another perspective called the, the heavenly view or the heaven view. Um, and basically this teaching holds very foundationally that we look, need to look at all of scripture in actual fact to understand this portion of scripture. Now, let me give you a short summation of this perspective. First of all, this perspective believes that even the Old Testament patriarchs and saints at the moment of their death went to heaven. Uh, we can see quite clearly that um, when Jesus dies on the cross, let's start with him. Jesus dies on the cross in Luke chapter 23 verse 46. Uh, and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus also speaks to the thief on the cross in, in verse 43 of that same chapter. And he says to him that today you will be with me in paradise. Um, so when we look at the Old Testament, we can see quite clearly. Remember Enoch uh, in Genesis chapter 5 verse 24. Uh, and also in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5, it speaks quite clearly that all of these Old Testament patriarchs and saints immediately went up to heaven. Uh, also remember Elijah. Uh, Elijah uh, was caught up into heaven in 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 1. Um, and ultimately we can see therefore that when we speak about the bosom of Abraham, um, Luke chapter 16 uh, verse 23 as it's called, um, could be a description of heaven. Uh, um, also, it's interesting that in Luke chapter 16, it's never described as a place of torment or it's never described uh, as a place of hell. But ultimately, it's always made known uh, that these individual entities, when they appeared or in actual fact, when they took up, uh, were took up uh, even before the cross, um, they appeared from heaven. Um, we remember the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, verse 3. Um, we can see quite clearly that Moses and even Elijah appeared um, not from the heart of the earth, but they were obviously uh, in a place next to the cross right there in a heavenly realm. Um, so uh, we can see quite clearly, therefore, that the Old Testament saints um, obviously weren't uh, physically resurrected yet. Um, they had to wait Christ's resurrection before their bodies could be resurrected. Um, and that is the reality we're all waiting for, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. Uh, but what we see is at the resurrection and ascension of Christ in Matthew chapter 27, uh, verse 53, very controversial portion of scripture, um, we can see that their souls were definitely in heaven already. Um, also, uh, it is interesting to note that uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8 says that Christ was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, um, which means... Uh, that obviously these Old Testament patriarchs or saints were saved by the merit of what Christ already would accomplish. Um, so when it speaks of Christ descending into the lower parts of the earth, um, uh, it is interesting to see that um, there's a portion of scripture in Psalms 100, uh, 139 uh, verse 15 um, that speaks of a woman's womb as being uh, or being described as the lowest part of the earth. Um, so it could speak of his incarnation. Um, so that is just um, 
very interesting. Um, also, interestingly enough, um, uh, we can see uh, that all of the Old Testament saints uh, had this understanding that they will ultimately be with God in death. Um, so, what do we do with this earliest apost uh, 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 little phrase in the uh, Apost uh, Apostles' Creed uh, that says that he descended into hell? Um, well, again, uh, we can see that this was added quite later, um, and ultimately um, we can see quite clearly that those souls that were in, in actual fact in, described in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 19, uh, they were in, uh, in absolute disobedience. So, in actual fact, uh, when Christ led captivity captive, uh, he was not leading friends into heaven, according to this, to this passage of scripture, but he was uh, bringing foes into bondage. Um, which is um, obviously a reference to the forceful defeat of the evil one uh, and his cohorts. Um, so, uh, we can see quite clearly that the Bible makes it absolutely clear um, when Jesus, in actual fact, declares to the spirits in Hades um, the full realization of what is taking place. Um, we know for an actual fact that Jesus declared as uh, the perfect Son of God uh, he was not born again in hell. Uh, he didn't go to hell to declare uh, in actual fact that uh, he now to suffer for us, but he was already the one that declared victory in the cross uh, over everything that was necessary. Um, also, very interesting, and this is just necessary for us to understand that Jesus didn't need to be born again. Um, John chapter 2 verse 25, uh, John chapter 3 verse 3 and 67, um, and you can also see in 2 Corinthians 5 21, um, Jesus was holy in himself um, and he was perfect and without sin him being born again in hell simply means that he had to repent from sin and that is not what the scriptures have to, what, what the scriptures have taught uh, as we've seen very clearly so uh, we can absolutely affirm that the completion of the life of Jesus uh, and him wroughting for salvation for us was completed in the cross and you can look at uh, John 19 30 Hebrews 1 verse 3 Hebrews chapter 10 uh, verse 14 to 15 um, even before he entered into the grave Christ already established victory for us so that is very important for us to understand um, interesting also uh, just read uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 because it's such an important scripture that we've discussed uh, verse 18 um, it shows quite clearly that even though he died in the fleshly realm, immediately was made life in the spiritual. Uh, he did not have to go suffer or became satanic or go uh, and be separated from God in, in his death. Uh, but he was ultimately uh, absolutely the, uh, in a perfect state uh, even at death. Um, when Jesus declares on the cross, it is finished. It was finished. Um, there was nothing else that needed to be done. What is the meaning of the death of Jesus? First of all, we need to understand it's vicarious. It is a substitution. The word vicarious comes directly uh, from the word vicar, which simply means that it is a substitute. Uh, and that is one that acts on the stead or in the stead of someone else. Uh, we can see quite clearly that Jesus was our perfect substitute. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6, uh, Matthew 20, 28, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21, uh, 1 Peter 2 verse 24, and Romans chapter 5 verse 8, Jesus was our perfect substitute. Uh, and here's another thing which is very important. When we look at the full understanding of scripture and what it means when we speak about the death of Jesus Christ, it was an atonement. It is important, uh, important for us to understand that atonement simply means to cover. It literally means to cover. Uh, this is an Old Testament idea, obviously, uh, which means that Jesus prophetically would cover our sins with his own blood. Uh, and let me give you a few scriptures concerning that as well. In the Leviticus law, uh, in Leviticus chapter 5, uh, we can see quite clearly from verse 2 to 7 that Jesus was the one that made atonement for our sins. He covered our sins. Uh, Psalms 51 verse 9. Also, uh, Isaiah chapter 38, uh, we can see in verse 17, Micah chapter 7 verse 9. Uh, and then also, ultimately, how it is explained in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 4 to 10. Uh, Here's another thing that you need to know about the death of Jesus Christ. It was a propitiation. Now, uh, this means that, uh, you know, propitiation is something that we need to understand quite clearly. Propitiation simply means that he turned away the wrath of God uh, and he, in actual fact, offered himself 
as an appeasement for man. So how did he turn away the wrath of God? Well, becoming a sacrifice for us. Uh, and we see this reality explained beautifully uh, in uh, John chapter 3 verse 36, Romans chapter 1 verse 18, uh, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 6, Romans chapter 2 verse 5, uh, Romans chapter 5 verse 9, 1, Corinth, uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1 verse 10. So we can see quite clearly that Christ's death means that it was a propitiation. Here's another two things that you need to know. The death of Jesus Christ was a reconciliation. Uh, now, there was a need for reconciliation between God and man. Uh, and Jesus ultimately provided that reconciliation for us. He brought us back into good stead with the Father, so we can cry, Abba, Father, and so we can stand in good stead with our Father. Uh, and we can see this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, Romans chapter 5, verse 16 to 17, and also 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 20. We can see that Jesus brought reconciliation. Lastly, we can also see that Jesus' death means that there was a ransom for our redemption. Uh, and this is very important because ransom simply means that there's a release for liberation for captives uh, that were supposed to die uh, by the payment of a specific price. Uh, now Jesus paid our ransom in full. We deserve death because we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but we were made alive in Christ Jesus. Uh, and this is prophesied already in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5, uh, Matthew chapter 20 verse 28, and Matthew chapter 9, or Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12. So it is important to understand that there is no forgiveness and no true salvation if we do not understand that Jesus was our substitute, He was our atonement, our propitiation, He was the one that made reconciliation for us and the one that redeemed us completely. God bless. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope uh, in actual fact that you will experience the full extent of the atonement of Jesus Christ and that those who are God's will be drawn unto Him and that He will make His work complete in you. Uh, be blessed. Uh, please let me know how you th what you thought about this clip. Please go like us on all our social media platforms. Uh, and also please uh, uh, let us know if there's anything else that we can discuss uh, that concerns you and anything uh, that would be of benefit to someone else. I just want to leave you again uh, with the understanding that uh, the purpose of these clips is not to stone somebody in particular but just simply to look at their doctrine through the biblical understanding of Scripture. Have a lovely day, be blessed, and I'll talk with you again.